This is my second video about shell programming. In the first video, I talked about a number of things you need to know to do shell programming, but I covered fairly little of what you are used to having in a programming language. Based on your experience programming in more conventional programming languages, you will be expecting control constructs. Conditional constructs in SH are based on commands exit statuses. It's a very solid and clean design. A command in Unix succeeds or fails. For example, given this file, if we do grep arn students, it succeeds, but if we do grep ern students, it fails. How do we tell? Well, for interactive exploration, we can use a special shell variable dollar sign question mark, which tells us the exit status of the last command. And we can use the echo command to see the value of this variable. Whereas grep arn students succeeds. In Unix or Linux, zero is the success exit status, and anything non-zero indicates a failure. Look at this shell script. Here we have an if. The ifs keyword in sh is followed by a command. An arbitrarily complex command can use any of the features of sh. If we run this shell script, we can run it by passing it to the shell. For one, you will see why I said echo end of list above. That's because the command passed to if is executed. If the command succeeds, we do the then clause. If the command fails, we do the else clause, if any. Let's watch it fail. Change Fred to Ford, there and there. If I run it, the grep will fail, and so we will do the else clause. So the syntax of the if statement is, we have the if keyword, then we have an arbitrary sh statement, as I said. The next command is then, and then we have as one or more statements for the then clause, then optionally the else keyword and one or more statements for the else clause. Then we have the keyword to end the if construct, which is fi if spelled backwards. This is from a European programming languages tradition, uh, reversing the keyword for the end keyword. It kind of grows on you. Remember that the if command executes an arbitrary other command. This is why the then has to be on the next line. If we were to put the then up here, there's no way for the shell to tell that that's not supposed to be an argument to grep. It is entirely possible to run grep forward students then as a command. So to make it uniquely parsable, we have to put the then on the next line, and that's the syntax of if and sh. You might argue that we don't need a then at all. That would be sensible, but that's just not the syntax in this particular programming language. Most normal modern programming languages are free format, meaning that any white space counts as the same spaces, tabs, new lines. Python is not like that, though. In Python, new lines are significant syntactically. SH comes closer to being free format than Python does, but of course we want return to separate commands interactively, so it also does in shell scripts. There's also a command separator of a semicolon. Again, though, by looking at what's simplest in SH, we're still wondering how to do the things which are the simplest in normal programming languages. How do you write if x is less than 3? There's a general testing command which exists for just this purpose, and it's called test. This is a command running test. It produces no output, but it succeeds because 2 is less than 3. That's what that means. That's what that's testing we can see that it succeeded. If we do test 3 is less than 2, it fails. 
So this is useful in an if statement, but in practice, of course, one of those arguments might be a variable. If we say x equals 5, then we could run test $x less than 3. The shell will substitute that variable x for 5 and run test 5 less than 3. So that fails because 5 is not, in fact, less than 3. Here's how we would use it in a shell script. So we're using test as the command in the if, and we can run that shell script, and the output is not surprising. So remember that our use of dollar question farther up above is just for exploration. In real life, we would put the test command in an if. We wouldn't use dollar question mark for this. Something else I should mention at this point, you may see people writing things like if left square bracket dollar x less than 3. And then we can write the then and whatever and, and if. This looks cute, but the way that it's implemented is a hack. Let's look at the test command. It's in slash bin, so this is an ls minus l of the test command. And there's also slash bin slash left square bracket. That's a file in slash bin. And that's what we're actually running above, where we said if left square bracket. If is always followed by a command. These are the same program as we can tell by using the Unix tool CMP to compare the files. No output means that they're identical. So you can write test, or you can write left square bracket, but it's important to understand that what if really does is, what follows if is a command. The command is executed and has all of the effects that it has from executing. Its success or failure exit status determines whether we take the then or the else clause in the F. Test has a number of numeric comparison operators, minus LT for less than, GT for greater than, minus EQ is equal to, minus NE for not equal to, possibly less defensively, minus LE for less than or equal to, minus GE for greater than or equal to. When, test, when the test program was devised, pretty much all programmers knew the Fortran programming language, and these are the two-letter codes from the numeric comparison operators in the Fortran programming language. These days, people mostly learn these two-letter codes when they learn about the test command, but that's okay. Test also does string comparisons. The basic comparison operators are equals and not equals. Now, everything in SH is a string, but this still makes a difference if you compare something like, for example, 0, 3, and 3. If you use the string comparison, they're unequal. If you use the numeric comparison, they're equal. Test also has file testing operators. Minus F and a file name says that the file exists and is a plain file. So if the file does not exist by that name, or if it exists but is not a plain file, then this would fail. Minus D space file, file exists and is a directory. And here's a, one that turns out to be useful from time to time. Minus S, file exists and is a plain file and is of non-zero size. And there are many other file testing operators. And other things such as Boolean operators, all this is in man test. Okay, so that's if. And the general idea of using a command's exit status as a Boolean value. We also use this command exit status concept for while. The while keyword is also followed by an arbitrary command. i equals zero, while test something. That can be any command. It doesn't have to be test. But here, while i is less than 10, we increment i and output it. Once we have these commands as booleans, we might need the equivalent of boolean constants. There's a command true, which is just exit 0, and false, 
which is just x at 1. In the previous video, we saw the command read. Read can be used in a while because it fails on end of file. While read xy will do that read command, and if it succeeds, it does the loop body and continues. If we hit end of file, it fails, and the loop is done. So I can type hello world, return, x is hello, and y is world. I'm going to signal end of file from the terminal. There's a special control character for that, control D by default. Like all processing until end of file, this makes more sense non-interactively. Here's a data file. I can run S4 with that data file as input. Here's a loop which keeps using the editor ed to remove the first line of a file so long as the file has a capital Q in it. While grep Q file, so as long as there is a Q in file, then we do this compound statement, which formulates input to ed using two shell commands, echo 1d, which means delete the first line, echo w, which means write the file. We don't need a quit command because when ed reads uh, end of file on the standard input, it will exit. The extra argument to ed, the minus sign, tells it to suppress some of the interactive stuff that it would normally output, like prompts. This script will work, but will produce some messy output. All of that is the output from the grep command, executed multiple times around the loop. We really wanted to use grep only for its exit status, not to see the lines with the queues, but just to check whether there is a queue in the file. Let's modify this. We could throw away the grep output by redirecting it to some file name we don't care about. But better yet, we will use a special file slash dev slash null. This is a device file with the simplest possible driver. The driver just says return zero. It does nothing. Therefore, the data is lost, which is what we want here. To run this, I'll restore the file. It's already edited it and removed all the queues, so let's restore from the uh, previous copy of it. Run this. The unwanted output is discarded. With all these conditions, we might want one more feature, the double vertical bar and double ampersand operators, which combine Boolean statuses just like in C or Java, or like the OR and AND keywords in Python. They also have the short circuit behavior, where the write operand is only evaluated if necessary. For example, we can write something like, if test x is uh, greater than 3 and test x is less than 10. So this is an if. As I said, the command to an if can be an arbitrary sh statement as complex as we like. In this case, it's a compound statement of two statements. The test dollar $x greater than 3 is executed. If this fails, then the write command is not executed and the exit status of the compound command is that exit status of the left command. If, on the other hand, the left command succeeds, then the right command is also executed, and the exit status of the compound command is the exit status of the right command. Something else about the if statement. Suppose we have an if-then-else statement like this. If something, then something else. Else if something else, then something else. Else something else. This kind of cascading if-then-else is pretty common, but if we write it like this, it's pretty messy. And if we had more conditions, it would be worse. Now, since sh is free format, we could write it like this. That helps a little to show the structure. The weirdest thing about this is that 
we will have an increasing number of FIs at the end all in a row as it gets more complicated. This also gets error prone. To deal with this, there is a special combined ELSIF keyword that looks like this. The difference is that this combined ELSIF keyword does not introduce an additional nesting level. So we have only one FI at the end, and the one on the right is correctly indented. Suppose we didn't have anything to do in the then case. We wouldn't usually write things like this, but every once in a while it's easier to write it like this um, because it's more difficult to invert the condition or, or something like that. And we have an empty then clause. Written like this, this is not syntactically valid in SH because the then clause is one or more statements, not the usual zero or more statements. So for a situation like this, we need the SH null statement, the statement that doesn't do anything, which in SH is just a colon. This is similar to the pass statement in Python or just a semicolon in C or Java. One final reminder to leave you with, don't do this. Don't run a command just to use its exit status as dollar question in test in an if. This is what if does. If checks whether a command succeeds or fails. So do this. Just supply the command directly to an if, if what you're trying to do is check whether it succeeds or fails. The third video in this series is about some other control constructs in SH but it begins with a detailed discussion of quoting in SH.